why risk controls? As I mentioned, you guys have already hopefully read the case studies and then you've got activity on those. Um, because of that, we have to put risk measures in place, uh, energy commodity trading in all its forms. Uh, basically, the SEC and the CFTC came in at one point and said that publicly traded energy companies will in fact have to institute some type of risk control program. We'll talk about the types of controls. And then last, we're going to talk about some recommendations. If you were to sit down with a company and make some recommendations for a risk program for them, I've got a list uh, of things that you might you know, want to be able to say to them or recommend to them. And we talked about these case studies already. I added a fourth one down there. You can see as late as 2006. Um, there was another trading company, uh, Amaranth, and they lost $6 billion trading NYMEX futures. Again, not enough oversight. Common issues throughout all of these, uh, I think hopefully you've picked up on that in the case studies. They were either the single or multiple rogue traders. And we say rogue traders, we're talking about people who did things on their own. They made decisions on their own. They were dealing in risky derivatives. These were not people dealing simply in uh, the underlying derivatives. In some cases, we know they were doing options, swaps, um, exotic options, and some other things. Uh, little or no accountability. This is the big one. Okay, there's there's really no line of accountability where there's uh, oversight. Uh, in several of these cases, in fact, in the three case studies that you had, there was a total control over the paper trail. Um, as we saw uh, in the um, case study with Dick Gleason, he actually controlled all of the accounting. So he controlled the execution through settlement and then had his uh, phony account set up. And this is one of the issues, this next point, the lack of understanding and recognition by the executives of financial derivative trading and the risks involved. Um, to this day, I still believe there are executives over companies where energy commodity trading exists, financial derivatives are used, where the executives truly don't understand the risks that the company is taking on with the various forms of uh, transactions even if they're presented with a daily report from a risk control group. I don't know that they fully uh, understand and can interpret those reports properly. So some risk measures, these are standard risk measures. One of the most common ones, the one that um, hopefully uh, is most well known, is mark to market. Now that's the value of the portfolio at the close of the day based on the settlement prices. Now in fact, Sim, the simulator, um, if you, you know, watched your position every day, if you had open positions, the simulator valued those based on the prices at the end of the day. And so that is the mark to market. You are taking all of your open positions because you have not yet uh, closed them and it's marking them against the settlement prices for the markets closing that day and putting a value on it. Then we have value at risk. Now this is a much more complicated risk measure. I don't expect you to uh, understand it in its entirety, but it's what's known as the theoretical maximum loss on a total book for a given period of time at a given confidence level, a defined holding period at expected market conditions. Now, I realize that's quite a mouthful. Um, there's a single number that comes out. What happens is there is a first step in, in calculating value at risk. The mark to market calculation is run on the entire book. So you'll have a mark to market number. And then what will happen is that will get compared to historical prices, but then also within the value at risk uh, system. And again, this is a calculation that's done by software. It's not a hand calculation. Um, there will be a Monte Carlo simulator uh, and a Monte Carlo simulator is really a random number generator. So in essence, the Monte Carlo simulator will come up with literally thousands of potential price scenarios. And those will get compared against the actual mark to market values for the particular day that the value at risk is run. And so this comparative analysis um, comes up with a single number. And that single number represents, again, a theoretical maximum one day loss on the book as it exists. Now the parameters, because this is a form of statistics, it's a statistical analysis. The parameters are that basically the result is saying, okay, um, 
the maximum loss on the book as it exists today, comparing the mark to market to these um, prices that have been generated by Monte Carlo Simulator, um, the company could lose as much as $10 million. Um, the confidence, the statistical confidence in this case, uh, on this VAR calculation uh, is 98%. And then there also has to be what's known as the holding period. In other words, the VAR calculation is done at the end of the day on the book as it currently exists with the mark to market as it was calculated for that day. However, in the VAR calculation, there has to be an assumption of how many days you could hold those positions open. So you'll have um, the, the single dollar value, which represents the maximum loss, a level of confidence, and 98% you know, usually would be the one to use because then you've only got 2% outliers on the other end. Um, but you might have you know, one day, two day, three day, four day, five day holding period. That's up to the company to determine. But the holding period that's chosen also represents um, or should represent a the reality when it would come to liquidating the position. So in other words, it would be unrealistic to have a single holding day period because you can't liquidate your entire book within one day. To do that, would then adversely impact the prices in the marketplace on that day, which in turn would adversely impact the mark to market at the end of that day. Other risk measures, profit and loss. Now, once you've calculated the mark to market, okay, remember you're going to have unrealized gains or losses. And so at the end of that day, the profit or loss total is gonna be the mark to market value and what you normally do is it becomes a cumulative number each day as you go through the month. So the mark to market gain or loss on day one is added to the mark to market day loss on uh, mark to market daily loss on day two and so on. So you have this running total. And then you also need to figure out the volumetric position. You want to know from a contractual standpoint, what is your exposure? So this is the total of all the derivative contracts that you have out there that are straight up contracts. Maybe they're futures, maybe they're swaps, but then also, you know, we touch briefly on the options delta effect. In other words, you know, uh, getting back to the options, if an option writer, okay, let's say writes a put or writes a call, they immediately have some exposure, which is quantified in the number of contracts that they might have to buy themselves or sell, okay, in order to fulfill the obligations under the options contracts if executed. So this has to be quantified. There's a certain number of contracts that are represented when the uh, delta calculation on the options is run. So for the true volumetric position of a particular book, it's all the open derivative contract volumes. In other words, again, things like swaps, um, forwards, futures, and then what the options delta calculation ends up being in terms of contracts. You have to add all of those together. Now you know the volumetric uh, position for the book itself. Uh, in terms of energy commodity trading, obviously we know in April 1990, uh, natural gas contract was launched. In 1983, the crude oil contract was launched. We know too that provided price transparency and market liquidity, you are now able to hedge your price risk but it also added some more uh, instruments for speculative trading. Um, it led to the proliferation of various financial derivatives, as we know, options such as puts and calls, more exotic options, and then swaps, both Henry lookalike uh, swing swaps and basis swaps. Now, the Securities Exchange Commission and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission had mandated that publicly traded energy companies have to implement a risk control program effective with their fiscal year for 2001. Okay, so what happened here is they had to report their mark to market value under their earnings. So in essence, at the end of every day, they had to go in and calculate the mark to market value of their open positions. Well, the federal government then said that represents revenue. You've either got unrealized gains or unrealized losses and you have to report those in earnings. Okay, well, for Enron, that basically gave them the license to steal. Why? Because what Enron did was set up various shell companies, paper companies, and then they would calculate the market to market earnings every day on those little companies. And basically those would show gains 
and the more earnings that the, all these companies were making uh, in, in terms of in total showed up on Enron's books. And so this was leading to a higher share price. So the state now also the other problem that happened was the traders now have a large stake in mark the market. Um, they want to manipulate the prices, set these forward curves, forward prices that we know are in the marketplace. Well, they were setting them for uh, certain price categories that for which they were reporting to the publications and others. So you can see they were starting to try to influence the cash marketplace, the cash publications, um, which you know is direct market manipulations. Then another thing they would do is roll positions forward and backwards to gain mark to market value. So they had positions that could be uh, liquidated and they could draw cash in and then turn around and put those same positions back on, they would do this. Again, we're talking about fluffing books up so that the books really didn't, uh, were not true reflection of actual earnings or cash positions of the companies. In a post Enron world, uh, in essence, a little more than a year after Enron collapsed, what had been the top five energy trading companies in the United States were gone. Uh, Wall Street you know, became very leery of energy trading companies. You'll find more companies today that are named energy service companies. Um, and Wall Street analysts, when they want to look at a company now, they're going to look at the book size. In other words, total volumetric uh, open positions and then the mark to market related to that. They don't really put much uh, confidence in value at risk. They're not as interested in that because, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's sort of theoretical. Um, there are you know, also uh, more and more companies uh, adopted FAS 133 hedge accounting. And what this did was allow them to shrink their speculative book. In other words, positions are not open if you can tie them to a physical transaction. And then, of course, there was the adoption of Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley is an extremely um, invasive and intensive uh, procedures and recording of pretty much every, you know, every single transaction, even down to the keystrokes in some cases. Now, here's where I mentioned uh, recommendations. If, if a company doesn't have a risk policy in place and they have to implement one, to me, first and foremost, executive training. They need to understand uh, what energy commodity derivatives are and the various types and the types of risk exposures that are out there trading them. Um, they have to establish risk policies and procedures. And within the policies and procedures, there has to be, number one, a statement of the purpose of the hedging activity. Um, you know, what is it that you have that exposes you to uh, price and market risk? Um, therefore, you know, you state why you're going to hedge. Uh, also, then you start to establish risk measures and, and limits. What's the daily maximum mark to market, uh, you know, loss that you're going to allow the trading company to have? What's the maximum VAR? Um, you need oversight. There needs to be a risk control desk and you need to have set positions within that desk and the responsibilities for each one of them. There needs to be a risk oversight committee. This is usually comprised of an executive panel. Uh, trading policies have to have violation penalties in them. In other words, you know, there has to be a situation where if a trader violates it, there is a penalty that they're very much aware of that's going to happen, which can include termination, uh, specific procedures, things like uh, deal sheets. Uh, daily checkouts uh, and those types of things. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, adopt FAS 133 hedge accounting, educate both internal and external auditors. It's kind of an odd thing, but from time to time, you find auditors who don't really understand financial derivatives either, and yet they come in to audit the books of companies that have financial derivatives uh, on their books. And then, of course, Sarbanes-Oxley, you have no choice but to implement Sarbanes-Oxley even as, uh, as I mentioned, as complicated uh, procedurally as it is.